Good morning. Welcome to day two of our New Horizons in Journalism Conference. Thank you for being here. Um, we had a great first day. Today is only half a day, so it'll be much, much easier. I'm David McDonald, the Executive Director of the World Press Institute. Um, once again, we want to thank the America for Bulgaria Foundation and the Association of European Journalists in Bulgaria for all the help with this uh, conference. We have two panels today. The first one is on disinformation and politicizing the pandemic with Michael Montgomery moderating. And the second panel is charting the future of independent media in Bulgaria. Uh, finally, for you Bulgarian speakers, we're going to have a panel in Bulgarian. Uh, and so for the English speakers, you'll need to have a headphone um, uh, to listen to the uh, English translation. First panel, of course, will be in English. But anyway, welcome. And I'm going to turn this over to Michael Montgomery. Thanks, David. Good morning. Dobro utro for everyone. Um, we are going to talk about disinformation and politicizing the pandemic. I'm just going to say a few words and then introduce our panel and uh, look forward to getting some questions from you all. Um, <clears throat> alongside the COVID-19 pandemic, there's been what the World Health Organization calls an infodemic, an overabundance of information, some accurate, some not. And in our digital age, infodemics spread like wildfire. They create a breeding ground for uncertainty. Uncertainty, in turn, fuels skepticism and distrust. It's commonly assumed that misinformation is largely a phenomenon of social media, but, and I think we're going to hear about this, um, it also appears in traditional media. Um, traditional media outlets have reported and sometimes amplified the voices of players across the political spectrum. In America, there was a study by a team at Cornell University that found that the media mentions of President Donald Trump made up by far the largest share of the infodemic, nearly 40% coming from the media. Um, and in addition to all this, there has been concerted efforts by various governments to suppress or even falsely, uh, even uh, falsify information about the pandemic with lethal results. So that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to hear from um, some interesting places where a lot of this has been uh, quite a stark situation. So let me introduce our panel first. To my left, Boriana Jambazova, sorry. Boriana Jambazova is a journalist and board member of the Association of European Journalists in Bulgaria. Boriana's work has appeared in the New York Times, The Economist, and Politico Europe, among other publications. Uh, to her left, uh, Johanna Kravchik is head of partnerships at Gazeta Viborcha. And, um, and to her left is Anna, Anna Babinets. We've heard, we heard both of you on panels yesterday, editor-in-chief of co-founder of Sleetsfo, Sleetsfo Info, an independent investigative journalism agency. All right. So I want to start with you, Boriana, um, in talking about Bulgaria. I, I want to go back, actually, to each of you to the first months of the pandemic. And when did you start seeing indications of something kind of weird, like weird information, misinformation that was getting out to the public um, that was really having a, some kind of an impact on either people's reactions, or responses, or the government's? So going back, you know, spring, winter, spring 2020. Right. Well, thank you, Michael. Um, well, early on, as you said, spring of 2020, uh, Bulgaria introduced a pretty strict lockdown. And, um, you know, at that point, globally, we didn't know uh, much about the pandemic in general. So uh, most of the media outlets were actually, you know, reporting uh, what the government was, uh, you know, their guidelines, um, their um, tips of how to stay safe, you know, washing hands, uh, following personal hygiene, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but I think this was, uh, you know, um, a phenomenon that we see everywhere. Um, when it started changing was, was later on in, in the pandemic. And um, again, World Wild, and as you quote the World Health Organization, they uh, basically dubbed this phenomenon as the, the infodemic uh, that was kind of spreading um, as fast or even faster than the pandemic itself. Um, 
So uh, social media was flooded with disinformation and conspiracy theories and, um, you know, sometimes out, outright lies uh, about uh, the coronavirus. Well, what makes Bulgaria different, though, is that we start noticing that in this, in this climate, um, mainstream media in the country also gave platform to kind of pseudo experts. Um, and at that point, point scientists you know already had learned a lot uh, about the coronavirus what works what doesn't in terms of measures um, but yeah unfortunately we saw not just social media but also traditional media uh, you know some of the most uh, watched read or listened to uh, media outlets inviting um, experts who were kind of downplaying the, the seriousness of the, of the disease and kind of giving controversial advice uh, that was contrary to what the back then scientific consensus was. And I, again, um, it's hard to pin down um, the exact reasons why we are here, and I'll, I'll say in a minute what I mean. And it's a mixture of, of reasons, again. Uh, but I think one of the crucial contributing factors to uh, having Bulgaria uh, having the lowest vac vaccination rate in the European Union, which is currently around 20%, so only 20% of Bulgarians are fully vaccinated, I think the spread of uh, disinformation played a, a key role. 20%. Right. And lowest in the EU. True. Wow. Uh, was there a conversation within the media, or, or when, if, it, if there was a conversation within the media about some of the things you just talked about, pseudo experts, um, maybe politicians misrepresenting things, did that conversation happen within the media at all? Um, well, it's increasingly uh, becoming an issue and, um, you know, a, a matter of, like, self-reflection, um, especially, you know, when it comes to the role of media. And um, I think what should be emphasized uh, in, in this case uh, is also this kind of twisted idea of what pluralism is, uh, because some some media outlets um, so like presenting this kind of alternative, what they call viewpoints, again contrary to the uh, scientific consensus and the facts, I would say, uh, by inviting again those uh, people who who kind of um, spread uh, vaccine. Uh, skepticism these days and they continue to be you know interviewees in studios um, in, you know in interviews etc so um, I would like to see more um, you know deeper debate on this issue but I think the fact that you know uh, <laughs> Another ranking that we're kind of at the bottom is that Bulgaria, you know, um, have one of the worst media freedom, um, again, in the European Union. And also, so a lot of the problems plag plaguing the media landscape um, is also like uh, playing a role here. Mm, that's all sort of connected. Joanna, what about the situation in Poland, going back to the beginning? of the pandemic. Um, what did you start seeing? Um, how was the government responding, etc.? <clears throat> right. Uh, so, um, well, obviously, as in every other country, uh, we could see the signs of disinformation um, from the very beginning of, um, uh, of pandemic in Poland. Uh, and I can see many similarities with what, uh, what Buriana uh, just said. However, what was quite uh, unique, I guess, uh, for Poland was uh, uh, actually the fact that this misinformation, disinformation very often um, was uh, coming from uh, um, state officials or public media. Um, you know, we believe Generally, that this right uh, to information, I think Pavel, uh, Pavel 
talked about it yesterday, that this right uh, to be informed and to make uh, like conscious choices based on reliable information is human rights. And I really believe that uh, in, um, uh, in pandemic times, um, in Poland we could see a very clear violation of this basic human right. And uh, you know, the Polish government and pro-government uh, media, private media, but also public media, this captured public media, were actually disinforming Polish citizens on um, on daily basis. And uh, what I mean here is a kind of propaganda of success, which is never good in a situation of a kind of danger or threat. So, um, yeah, so they were like, you know, showing the, these anti-pandemic decisions or steps um, of government officials as like super successful and uh, very needed and uh, very right. And if you watched only Polish state um, television news over this whole year, actually 2020, uh, you would have no idea that Poland was actually not doing well at all. There is this uh, Bloomberg's COVID resilience ranking and Poland has fallen to the 50th position position out of 53 countries. So we're really not doing very well, but, um, but public uh, television and radio and pro-government uh, newspapers and portals uh, were simply spreading this, uh, this very sophisticated propaganda uh, of, um, of success, which was very, very harming and damaging uh, the society. I remember when our prime minister said a year ago, I think it was June, that the coronavirus is retreating and there is no more reason to be afraid. And it was just, just the beginning of summer and uh, people heard it and said, yes, fine, we can go on holidays. And they did it. And then the next wave came and we're like, okay, well, like, what happened? Why did you say that? I mean, it was clearly disinformation. Um, the, um, our, our community. So uh, what was actually um, interesting was the fact that um, it was us, independent media, they were labeled as disinformating agents. We were um, accused of uh, spreading disinformation because what we were doing was simply reporting on what uh, was happening in government uh, circles, mostly in, uh, in the Ministry of Health. We discovered, I mean, we investigated and then discovered few, um, well, scams, I would say. Uh, which were very much related to pandemic situation. You know, my, my newspaper, Gazeta Wyborcza, uh, reported, for example, that the health um, <clears throat> ministry spent over 1 million euro on, fake ma on face masks that were later um, uh, found uh, not to meet safety standards. And what was uh, interesting in this case, it was that the contract originated from our Ministry of Health ski instructor, which was like, Wow, there was a, there were, yes, there was another. Maybe uh, they, they were ski masks then. Right? It, well, <laughs> well, even 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 they were uh, you know ski masks. I think they would be like safer than what whatever was like kind of delivered to us because like it was completely useless. There was another another scam uh, that uh, some colleagues uh, from other media actually discovered, and it was about buying by Ministry of Health. Uh, over 1,000 ventilators, so something like you know life supporting, very needed in the times of pandemic. We paid uh, over 40 million euro for that, and uh, we learned that actually uh, it was bought from a company owned by a gun dealer, and actually not a single device was delivered to Poland, and the producers of ventilators stated that like nobody ever contacted them about it. So we did all these investigations and then like reporting it like alongside you know the chaos in the ministry, chaos also in uh, uh, in providing information, chaos in statistics, which was like great. I mean great in terms of like grave. Um, this, you know, in the lens, manipulating facts, manipulating data, uh, but we were uh, told that we are this disinformating uh, agent. And of course, you know, we paid heavy toll for doing our job. Well, did the government actually take steps against you? Oh, yes, they did. I mean, on the one hand, um, um, you know, 
When I talked with my colleagues from other newspapers uh, around Europe, uh, they told me often about you know, different uh, measures or steps their government uh, wanted to take or took actually uh, to make the situation of media better. For example, you know, these um, paid uh, state ads campaigns you know, about pandemic or some uh, tax regulations that would ease the situation of media uh, in the times of pandemic, um, d different types of, um, uh, of measures. And uh, what was interesting in Poland is that indeed we, we had um, this uh, public information campaigns uh, ordered by uh, by our government. However, not all media were uh, actually invited to take uh, to take part in it. So, pro-government media were uh, actually given advertising budgets from from the government to publish information, for example, about you know pandemic, about restrictions. You know, these were like basic information that should be delivered to every Polish citizen, and we as Gustavo Borcia and also some other independent outlets in Poland, we were simply not invited to take part of it. So we were, no, we, we were not given money to publish the ads. However, well, we did publish this information kind of for free because we wanted our readers not to be discriminated against. So it was, well, for us, it was like the basic, um, the basic thing that, you know, every newspaper should do just to keep um, its, they, its readers informed. Uh, but yes, and, and it happened a few times. So basically, pro-government media just made, you know, deals of their life publishing and like, you know, taking these advertising budgets and, and publishing uh, the ads. And well, we were left with nothing, but it's fine. Uh, the other thing was... Um, oh, I, I'm so, yeah. so, so these were paid advertisements. The government was, was, was paying yeah. select media. Of course, uh -huh. but not us. Right. Well, this is like situ this. This is like Polish reality. You know, I can I can talk about it with like smile on my face because it's like you know, like daily bread right now. So mm. the other thing was uh, this idea um, of introducing a new advertising tax, um, which was like aimed at um, news publishers. And um, the revenue, like money from this tax, uh, was to be um, uh, to be like funneled to um, uh, to health sector, which was hit uh, gravely by by the pandemic, obviously. But what it me what it meant actually for smaller um, news outlets and also independent news outlets would be that. The, the, that they might be, they might have been um, actually uh, well financially damaged because of it. And of course, th this was not the case uh, for pro-government media because, as I just uh, told you, they were given a kind of financial aid, like in form of advertisements, you know, these campaigns from uh, from the government. So actually, this tax w w would would have been very painful for independent media and for smaller media, and. What was amazing, actually, was what happened then. Because we could see like a kind of wave of solidarity among uh, independent uh, news outlets. And we together decided uh, that on one day, we will show Polish citizens what it would mean to not to have independent media in Poland. And we had a blackout. Uh, every newspaper, independent newspaper in Poland, published um, like a black first page of their newspapers. And the landing pages of these independent news portals were also blackouts. So there were like no news for one day. And I think it made an impact because the tax wasn't introduced. Right. The end. Wow. Um, that's, that's amazing. Uh, that's quite symbolic. Um, Anna, uh, I want to ask about Ukraine. Uh, were you seeing some of the similar things there in terms of the, in terms of the government, um, pro-government media, but also just, you know, the impact of social media spreading some of this uh, disinformation or misinformation? 
Um, I'm actually listening to my colleagues, and uh, I thought it's uh, the worst situation in Ukraine. But when I am listening to, <laughs> to them, I see it's a lot of uh, the same things, even worse things. Uh, but when we are talking about disinformation, uh, I think that we should look at numbers. Yeah, now in Ukraine, it's only 13 percent of fully vaccinated people. So yeah, 13. Yes by yesterday um, uh, data. So, I mean, these numbers can show, I think, that part uh, of these numbers is result of disinformation, result of, cons uh, result of conspiracy theories in social networks, because people in Ukraine mostly don't trust government. And is, if vaccination is campaign made by government, we will not do this. There are a lot of reasons why people don't do this. Like, <clears throat> I'm just giving a small example example, uh, now we have a new wave of um, a pandemic and new restriction uh, and few days ago it was announced that only school uh, which have uh, 70% of vaccinated teachers will be open. Uh, if it less, they will be closed. So yesterday I saw screenshots from teachers' chats uh, how to buy certificate about vaccination. So I think you understand how it works if teachers who teach kids uh, want to buy certificate about vaccination. So <laughs> because they don't want to be vaccinated, but they don't want to lose the work and they just want to buy this. And I know that it works. It works through uh, with the medical, with doctors, all the stuff. So, I mean, now I'm talking about uh, some results of disinformation. But uh, if we talk about uh, beginning, how it was, trying to uh, remember how it was in the beginning of um, pandemic, when pandemic started in, in Ukraine, around the world. Um, I remember that, uh, of course, the Ukrainian government uh, was confused. People didn't know what to do. And uh, since uh, our president and our government is former showmen, you know, that they, our president, uh, he was comedian. Uh, he had like TV show and uh, they didn't know what to do when pandemic started and they just decided to look good, uh, to, to do something for Instagram pictures. So, you know, um, and uh, uh, of course, it was important for them to look good uh, for the world. And uh, in the beginning, we as journalists, as watchdogs, uh, we start to check every information they provided, they gave us, now to figure out if, gov if government uh, did good work, if they spent uh, public money in good way. So every day we checked all information. And of course, we found a lot of misinformation. We found a lot of lie. And uh, one of them, it was uh, about testing amount of testing because uh, Ukrainian government wanted to look good uh, in front of words that we have a lot of testing and we have small amount of cases. But when we start to check how many tests uh, could uh, laboratories do around the Ukraine, we figure out that it's not possible the numbers they give us. So they just uh, created numbers of testing because no one could check. And I think that it was partly like Soviet uh, uh, planning that this uh, city should do this number, this city should do this number just for having good numbers uh, in front of the world. So, and then we checked, we published our stories, we published that laboratories couldn't do that. They just, there is some process of doing this testing and it's not possible to have 100 per day because they have power only for doing like 20 per day. So we published stories like this, that it was a lie about numbers of testing. And another Instagram <laughs> story is that, uh, of course, we figure out that in Ukraine, uh, government figure out that we didn't have enough face masks, enough equipment, ventilators, and when Ukraine started to uh, buy uh, outside of Ukraine, all the things uh, needed for fighting this pandemic, we figure out that uh, all other countries already did that few weeks ago, so we have nothing to buy. And in the end, in a couple of weeks, um, a big plane with uh, masks, ventilators, boarded in Ukraine, landed in Ukraine, and uh, president, prime minister went to meet this uh, plane to take pictures of the stuff. But the biggest problem was uh, no one knew what's there. 
I mean, how many, how, how many stuff there, how many face masks, how many ventilators, how much it costs. And when we start to figure out, we got information from our sources. Everyone was really scary to share what exactly is there. So we knew that it's something really useful and important, but we didn't know for what money, who spends this money. Maybe it's businessmen, and we figure out that it's some businessmen who used government plane for putting some goods, their goods, to that plane too. <laughs> yes, but and it was kind of secret what exactly is there. And then when, when we found out what was there uh, and how they split there, we also found out that uh, part of rapid tests government sent to special uh, government uh, medical center only for them. And they marked this like for parliament, for parliament members, for government members. We got this from our sources. Of course, they never admitted that. But they, you know, so good pictures for Instagram. And uh, in the same moment, uh, uh, they just did something for themselves. So, I mean, when we're talking about first months, first weeks, our government was confused. And we found a lot of things like our colleagues around the world found and we published that. And uh, sometimes, of course, our government and people from government were not happy with it. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you, uh, we, we heard about Poland where there really was um, attacks on, on the independent media for trying to do their job. What, what, did you experience that at all in Ukraine? Not actually. I can't say that it was something like that. Sometimes uh, people from Ministry of Health, they say like uh, it was some announcement like you, you are not professional, you don't understand how it works. Like, you know, it was like comments, uh, like if you don't figure out, don't publish anything. But mostly it was comments or announcement or something. I can say that uh, they tried to, to push us or to press us or to not, we didn't, we didn't have that. So I want to ask you about social media companies. Um, there, there's been a huge debate uh, in the U.S. about the role of social media companies in um, transmitting, circulating misinformation, disinformation. There's been uh, efforts by social media to uh, contain some of that, and then there's a counter-argument that it's censorship. Um, I know that in other areas, uh, social media companies in other countries, in other languages, are not often as aggressive uh, in, in monitoring what's going on. Um, and I don't know if that's the case with COVID in your countries, but I am curious, you've touched on the role of social media, but talk to me a little bit more about any kind of accountability, any kind of uh, conversation about their responsibility in these areas. Um, Joanna? Right. Um... I don't know if I can say anything like exceptional um, or different from what was actually happening uh, across Europe. We, obviously, we did uh, observe a wave of uh, fake news and disinformation targeting these most uh, sensitive uh, topics, such as uh, you know, cure for. Um, for COVID, um, you know, conspiracy theories uh, about um, who's actually benefiting from the pandemic. And then uh, when uh, the vaccination uh, action started, this whole debate, I don't know if I can even call it a debate, uh, this whole craze around uh, whether to be vaccinated or not. And if you vaccinate, what's happening? What's happening to you? You know the po policies of um, of uh, social media uh, platforms are quite uh, generic. I would say. I mean, there were no specific uh, activities taken by um, by Facebook uh, in Poland. Apart from these, they were introduced mostly like around around the globe. So we we were informed, and we could see actually, you know, the fact checkers working, you know, um, especially you know caption or like, you know, labeling information in a way f Facebook declared to do. And uh, it was actually uh, like kind of working. However, we have to remember that, um, you know, th this type of disinformation uh, 
firstly, like the source of this information is usually like kind of outside. It's only like republished on Facebook. This is one thing. And the real discussion very often um, takes place in, um, in Facebook groups, not really like in comments because you can see, of course, you can see, you know, the activity of, you know, trolls and so on and so forth. But these groups are the, the, the places where people are sharing their, I don't know, conspiracy theories or, you know, their thoughts about um, about uh, harm of uh, um, of um, uh, of uh, vaccinations, and they are like reinforcing, you know, their beliefs there, right? Because they they feel that they are creating a community, and this is this is quite uh, quite dangerous. And as, as far as I know, although I'm not a specialist in uh, in um, uh, in social media platforms, but as, as far as I know, nothing has been done when it comes to you know this type of communication. Right. Anna or Boriana, any any um, relevant uh, experiences in Bulgaria or Ukraine in terms of social media and? holding social media companies accountable for these kinds of things, misinformation. Um, just maybe briefly, as you mentioned, Michael, in local languages, it's very different uh, when this information is being spread in English. Because again, uh, Facebook, Twitter on the global scale, uh, you know, marked some of those video that was spreading conspiracy theory as, um, you know, harmful uh, as disinformation, etc. In Bulgarian, I mean, I can talk probably about towards the end of last year, some of these, like the pandemic video, for example, uh, because it was with Bulgarian subtitles, it could still be found in various, um, you know, platforms. And again, because I guess it's, it's harder uh, to, you know, monitor uh, the spread of uh, conspiracy theories when it's kind of a different language. Um, actually, we are uh, we in Ukraine a little bit lucky because we have Russian propaganda, uh, and uh, for years of war with Russia, uh, there are few pretty strong, uh, good quality organization uh, which work with disinformation. They just find uh, uh, good examples of Russian propaganda or other disinformation, and uh, they are pretty powerful. And other media republish that so. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Russians. Uh, we uh, we have practicing for many years to fight with disinformation, uh, and because of it, uh, social networks like Facebook, like uh, well, Facebook is very popular in Ukraine, not only like France platform, it platform for uh, political things. So um, so thanks. <clears throat> Thanks to this, we have some, uh, uh, we know how to fight this propaganda, but <clears throat> There is also, I think it's Ukrainian thing, uh, Belarusian, Belarusian thing, and Russian thing. We have an, an, an anonymous uh, Telegram channels. If you know what is it, you know Telegram, yeah. And uh, Telegram channels, it's usually a place for publishing all these conspiracy theories, and they are creating and disappearing, and uh, that uh, Telegram channels were uh, uncontrolling. It was, fa it was hard to find who was there and they were pretty powerful and made some influence uh, for example I think that in every country you had something like this when uh, Ukrainians uh, were uh, evacuated from China and went in the beginning of um, uh, of pandemic uh, plane with Ukrainians came to Ukraine and uh, they needed to be in observation for two weeks uh, it was beginning March uh, one year and a half ago uh, and um the government decided that people, Ukrainians from China, will uh, go to small city uh, in uh, to um, to hospital to being two weeks in observation. Uh, it's, it's very very small city. In one moment, some telegram groups were created, and people from that city start to fight with that people. And it was like a lot of hate there that they shouldn't be in our city. And when buses with these people came, people start to crash buses.
Uh, and uh, after that, some Ukrainian media, good media, they published investigation about this Telegram groups, about trolls who made this. So all this hate which was made uh, in that small city was made by Telegrams. And uh, the journalists fi find out that it was uh, people from Russia who created all the stuff. And by the way, about that story, uh, HBO, I think they published um, uh, the movie about that. Yeah, but <laughs> yes, I know that they did. They went to Ukraine for doing this, uh, for doing the movie. Yes, it was really... Uh, it was really a shame uh, how they, it was Ukrainians who fight with Ukrainians. And we know that all the things were provocated by t Telegram channels, Viber groups, all the stuff. People start to fight with Ukrainians, you know. So uh, when we're talking about disinformation, we have very different things. Like good uh, organization which knows how to fight with disinformation, Russian disinformation, propaganda, and stuff like this, you know, like like uh, when some uh, social media can create very big hate Ukrainians against Ukrainians. Wow, that's, that's real, you know, the real world, this stuff becomes very real and not just in people's minds. Um, I wanna get to questions in a second. We did have a question coming in from uh, uh, online, which is relevant to what you were just talking about, Anna. And that is, um, there's been a boom in fact-checking initiatives in, in response well, prior to the pandemic, uh, but since then, to what, extent do you think those efforts um, and investments have been effective and are there other approaches that could have uh, had better potential? Mm, I do value uh, a lot fact-checking initiatives. Um, however, uh, whenever I'm asked about uh, um, about what uh, is actually working best when it comes to, you know, verifying news and, uh, you know, like teaching people this kind of, um, um, yeah, the, the, you know, this, this, this way of thinking that uh, can dif differentiate between uh, true information from false information. My answer is always uh, the same. What, in my opinion, works best is um, providing people with quality news <laughs> and uh, making this news as available as possible. So uh, I think what is, uh, what is actually working uh, the best is making sure that um, news uh, landscape in a given country is, um, is pluralistic, is uh, open, is big and is of high quality so that people know that there are places where they can go and read information that will be checked and is reliable. I think this is, this is very important and uh, we need fact checkers but we mustn't forget about the fact that actually the backbone is, uh, you know, quality news outlets. Oriana, what about the, that question um, in terms of Bulgaria? Right. Um, I tend to agree with uh, Joanna. Uh, you know, we actually develop um, a section called the Chronicles of the Infodemic, uh, where we, we kind of um, debunk, uh, you know, these major conspiracy theories and rumors related to the pandemic. And the Association of uh, European Journalists also started a fact-checking unit, which is the first kind of... Um, such uh, endeavor uh, of sorts in the country. And many of the news, of course, they were checking were related, again, to the coronavirus. But in, in general, uh, I, I agree with Joanna that, you know, um, it's, it's really up to providing quality information. So uh, as we discussed earlier, people can make informed decision. I mean, you as a publication, as a reporter, if you don't follow like the basic principles of like, 
fact checking, but like varying, uh, verifying your information, not just debunking after the fact, but like, uh, you know, when, you know, the government of Ukraine or in Poland or in Bulgaria and whatever, they provide some stats that maybe they're not correct or uh, etc. Or again, just uh, doing your homework and Googling the expert that you're about to uh, invite in your TV show or whatever, or just to be interviewed to check their backgrounds because as I mentioned earlier, some, some of um, those people who are still, again, being interviewed by, uh, by media, um, they were proved to be providing not factual information and some journalists still continue to, to go to them. They're kind of the, the go-to person. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's really also for me providing context because again, you can never be uh, sure what uh, whoever you invited will be telling you, but, but if you know that they're lying to your audience, you should be the one you know, saying this uh, and confronting them w with the facts. So um, I think it's a, it's a mixture of things. Fact checking is definitely necessary, but also like providing context, explaining the background, uh, especially in a situation where, um, you know, it's very dynamic and is changing uh, very quickly. And just to go back to the beginning of the pandemic, actually, um, one of the silver linings or the positive aspects was that um, a lot of reputable publication in Bulgaria saw um, an increase in their uh, viewership or readership because people were really hungry for, uh, you know, reliable information in a, in a, at a time of a, you know, global public health crisis. Um, so they weren't going at that point to tablet style, uh, you know, media or controlled media who were like, again, spreading disinformation. They wanted to hear about the facts. So, and I think this highlight the need of really uh, fact-based quality reporting. Well said. Um, are there any questions from the audience here about media's handling of the pandemic disinformation? Um, well, if you have any questions, uh, raise your hand. I, 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 Joanna, you talked a little bit about, um, well, I, I'm curious to all of you what concerns you have about other steps the governments, your governments might take um, in terms of uh, limiting the ability of the media to report in these kinds of situations. And Joanna, we were talking a little bit about um, your concerns, say, in the border with Belarus. Uh, and, and talk to me about what, what those concerns are mo moving forward. You know, one of the... Um the greatest concerns uh, in the past 18, 20 months, 18 months of the pandemic in Poland was this threat of uh, introducing the state of emergency in our country. And uh, despite there were like all, um, you know, arguments for doing that, um, our government uh, did not decide to do that. Even though, you know, the situation with COVID was really, really um, difficult and grave, uh, there was no decision to introduce the state of emergency, mostly because in 2020 we had uh, the presidential elections, 2020, yeah. And uh, we had uh, this, uh, um, uh, this need of, uh, well, not we, the government um, ruling party had this need of actually uh, having these uh, presidential elections and with the state of emergency, it would have been um, simply impossible. So they didn't uh, introduce the state of emergency, although we were kind of uh, completely prepared for that. We made all contingency plans, um, how to publish media in the state of emergency, because what basically the state of emergency does is is limiting um, the operations of civil society organizations and the media. So we had all this plan, you know, how to function in such a situation. Luckily, back then, a year ago, uh, there was no need of introducing our contingency plans. However, um, this year, a few weeks ago, we um, were faced with a difficult situation um, on uh, our border with Belarus. 
uh, which uh, faced uh, the influx of, um, of refugees um, from different places of the world, like Middle East, but also Africa, um, who were trying to cross uh, our border, meaning also the border of the European Union, um, from Belarusian side. And uh, obviously, uh, we were very much, we as media, we were very much interested in reporting on this situation. And there were many reporters and journalists at the border uh, asking relevant questions. You know, what is happening there? Why these people are being deprived of their basic rights, meaning um, the right of applying for, um, for the status of a refugee? why our um, uh, our border control um, um, s service is actually doing something that is practically illegal, meaning doing pushbacks. So like pushing these people back to Belarus and Belarusian, um, Belarusian um, service, they were like pushing them back to Poland and it was like never ending. And it has been like this for a few, few weeks now. And when the situation started being like really, uh, uncomfortable for the government, they decided uh, that they will use this situation to introduce the state of emergency, stating that this is actually a threat to uh, Polish democracy because they, they, they see the situation as a hybrid war um, from Belarusian side. So they introduced the state of emergency at the borderland with, uh, with Belarus, which means that media is not allowed to be there anymore, as well as, so, as, as civic society organizations. And there are like dozens, if probably not hundreds, we don't know actually how many refugees are there at the border. We don't know because media is not allowed to be there. And uh, what we decided to do we, meaning independent media in Poland, like 40 of us, over 40 right now, signed a declaration stating that, well, we will not abide to this state of emergency laws. And we will just continue doing what we are supposed to do, being in places and in time uh, where and when um, there is a possible violation of human rights. And we really don't, um, I mean, we don't accept, you know, this, this argument that it might be, you know, difficult military situation. Journalists should be there when the situation is difficult, also from military point of view. So we really believe that uh, our presence there is uh, of utmost importance. And uh, we decided to send our journalists at the border even risking that they will be fined or imprisoned. And it was, uh, it was decided by 40 independent outlets in Poland who are sending their journalists at the border, despite the fact that it is uh, illegal at the moment. And what's happened? Well, there were, there were two uh, journalists from uh, Onet Portal uh, actually uh, detained and they were fined. Uh, what is interesting is that uh, we actually um, uh, we established a kind of uh, informal uh, fund for legal aid for these, uh, for these uh, journalists. Of course, you know, it's not so acute when, when you work for a big uh, company, but for smaller, you know, independent uh, journalists, but also s civil, uh, civil society servants or activists, uh, we just wanted them to feel kind of, you know, safe. In this, in this situation. You know, I cannot tell you what is happening exactly because many of our journalists are there like undercover. Uh -huh. So I, <laughs> like, you know, dressed as pilgrims, for example, because like pilgr pilgrimage is still allowed. So, right. So I cannot tell you the details, but indeed we are there. And, you know, it's very important to, to, to report about it because that, that there, has, there, have been be, there have been casualties there, like five people, five refugees already been found dead. And the situation will be deteriorating. So, yes, I'm very brave. I mean, I'm very, very uh, proud of my brave colleagues. Anna, um, I want to ask you, if we're heading um, into winter, if we get another hope we don't, a big upsurge or a new variant or whatever. What are your biggest concerns um, in terms of uh, media situation in Ukraine? Are, are all these lessons going to be learned and people will respond differently? Or what, what, what are your biggest concerns? 
Um, uh, actually, I think the biggest concerns about uh, permission for journalists, uh, permission to access to uh, press conferences, to, I mean, when we're talking about COVID, sometimes politicians use this like for, oh, no, only 10 people can be there and it's not, uh, it's not you because your media is small and you will not, we will not have access to talk to politician. One year ago, we had situation when a Ukrainian parliament sent a letter to my agency that your accreditation accreditation of all of your journalists were cancelled because you're not uh, covering uh, the work of parliament uh, like often enough or good enough and it was very big scandal because we cover pretty good uh, work of parliament especially some members of parliament who has uh, like uh, uh, a lot of money in their declaration I mean we just cover uh, parliament not in that way parliament wants us to cover so as uh, they use situation then I talk to people they said we just wanted to uh, to delay uh, media and journalists because of COVID, you know, that's excuse. Uh, just to say that we want limited uh, amount of journalists here or there or there. In the end, uh, we have accreditation, of course, because it's very easy to understand that every week we report something about Parliament. We just come there to catch people to answer our questions because we <laughs> uh, do investigations. So mostly I think it's about access and permission and they will to press conference of president or big politicians. They can say, we have not enough space we have only like few uh, places and you are not national big media you are not national big channel so you can just sit and listen on tv how it is so mostly it's about that i understand partly but in the same moment we see that independent media will not be because they are mostly small will not be allowed to talk to politicians and ask uh, direct questions i think this is the biggest my concern about that um, we have a question from one of our online viewers, and I'm going to sort of try to um, paraphrase it, but I think what they're getting at is, you know, the work of investigative reporters is to raise questions, be skeptical towards some of the things our, the government tells us. Um, and the, 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 the viewer is asking, uh, is there a concern or have you seen that that kind of skepticism reinforces or could reinforce a skepticism towards what the government is saying about the pandemic or the government response. Not that that is at all your intent, but that's what the person is interested in. Is there, is there a risk, is there a danger, or is that something you're conscious of? Boriana. In other words, if we can't believe what the government's telling us about the import of PPEs, for example, why should we believe what they're telling us about the pandemic? Right. Well, I think we should go back to the basics, and I <laughs> truly believe that one of the um, jobs of, like, the job of a journalist is to raise questions, as you said. So. Um, well, it's, again, it's a complicated issues, and it comes to the, the role of, of journalists and, and the media in general. But as my colleagues here highlighted, if we know that in Poland or the Ukraine, and for that matter, there were some like shady deals that Bulgarian government in the past did. I mean, there was this, and it was actually the work of investigative journalists who uh, revealed that uh, you know, a plane supposedly bringing, uh, you know, masks and um, PPE uh, is actually full of uh, dates. <laughs> and I dates. mean, yeah, like the, the fruit, <laughs> the right dates. So um, this is a question of, of a bigger debate, but we do need journalists to ask these questions, even if that might uh, deepen the distrust of, of people in a government. And I'm aware that this is a very sensitive uh, question in, again, at a time of a public health crisis. Um, but we, we cannot just like turn a blind eye when there is like abuse of power or like taxpayer money being channeled to like shady deals, even when it comes to um, health issues at, at, at least. Uh, that's my opinion. Um, 
Anna or Jana, any final thoughts? Uh, I think actually it's mostly a philosophical question because uh, many people in Ukraine want to simplify things. We trust government or we don't trust government, yes? But the uh, word is not uh, so simple. In some uh, questions we trust government, in some questions no. And our work, I know some people ask us, why you never uh, write something good about government? I tell some guys, we are, you know, like doctor. When you come to doctor, uh, doctor will never tell you that you are good or almost never uh, you know it's our work we do this we decided to do this it's our mission and our responsibility of course we find bad things but it doesn't mean that everything is bad it doesn't mean that we shouldn't uh, um, that we shouldn't trust government in some understanding yes and uh, very important to have critical mind to understand, yes, it's true, it's not true. Of course, I mean, I, say, I, 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 I uh, uh, told you the numbers, 13 percent fully vaccinated people. And it's because Ukrainians want to have simple answers for complicated questions. We don't trust government, so we will not vaccinate it. So we will just buy certificates, yes. So it's a philosophical question. It's about critical uh, mind, it's about uh, uh, not like simple things around the world. So, Anna and Boriana actually have said everything I wanted to <laughs> conclude with, and uh, well, obviously this is not our role to um, to make the institutions stronger. Our role is to make the institutions accountable. So, and let's keep to our role. Thank you. A good a place to stop on. Thank you, Boriana, Joanna, Anna. Thanks for doing this.